sometimes stupidity pays off. And I'm wondering if that's what just took place in the trial of Robert Tellis. You know, this is the man accused of murdering and now convicted of murdering uh, Las Vegas reporter Jeff uh, German uh, in the giant costume. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It looked like a Halloween costume. Big sun hat, blaze orange. Maybe he was trying to go hunting or just have everybody in the neighborhood point and go, what the hell is that? It was the most non-inconspicuous hitman I've ever seen in my life. All the way down to the video of him murdering German uh, on his side lawn. But the hair, the hair. See, someone dresses up in a Halloween costume. What do you usually also have on? A wig. That usually kind of completes the outfit. But somehow that was a bridge too far for some jurors on this trial. And they thought, why? No, no, no. This one has hair and he's bald. How could it possibly be him? So they ended up giving him life with the possibility of parole in 20 years. Theory. This narcissistic monster could be out in 20 years. Joining me to discuss, Eric Faddis, defense attorney, former prosecutor, are you shocked? You know, not shocked by the verdict. The The sentence, yes. however, uh, did raise some eyebrows for, for a lot in the legal community. And, um, you know, that's perhaps on the lenient side and giving Telus an out uh, in, in a shorter time than most people realize. I was very, I mean, I was not surprised by the guilty verdict. I was surprised how long it took to get to the guilty verdict in a case like this. I know there's no such thing as an open and shut case, and this really just proves that. Um, because it just seems so evident. The evidence was there of, of, look, there's no way this guy isn't the guy who did it. He's horrible on the stand. He's digging his hole. But yet, you know, he, he seems not like the brightest guy with a lot of the things he's, do he's done. And, you know, if you got one out there, there's going to be more. And I think we might have had two on the jury that uh, also were like, because huh. we're getting uh, reports in from some of our colleagues over at uh, Law and Crime that after the fact... Um, after the, you know, the jury was uh, you know, done, the verdict was given, the sentence was given, uh, apparently two of the jurors, and this is unconfirmed by us, but, uh, unconfirmed reports say, but two of them are really hung up on the hair. They kept, and this was more of a compromised verdict where they sat down, it was either going to be hung, uh, or it was going to be this. So instead of the, the full life sentence or the 50 years, they went with this to get the conviction. I know it's a jury of our peers, supposedly, but our peers are getting dumber by the day. <laughs> Thoughts on that statement? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it, you never know what's going to happen back in those deliberation rooms and what jurors are going to give weight to, what they're going to believe and not believe. Something that might appear plain and apparent to, to you and me uh, might strike a juror differently. And it sounds like it, it did strike at least two of these jurors differently. Yeah, with that disguise, you know, there's a strong likelihood that that a person could easily, like you said, wear a wig, put on glasses, especially if, you know, they're trying to be in a disguise. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was I was surprised the jurors really latched on to that as much as they may have. Because in order to latch on to that, you have to buy into the discombobulated make no sense theory that Robert Tellis was trying to push, which I just had a conversation with Bob Mata about it. We were trying to figure it out completely. And it always just kind of ends in, eh. Uh, like, like this is not a, a, a theory I'm going to push to anyone because it doesn't really have an end. It doesn't really, it, it, there's, there's big chunks missing. And I still couldn't reiterate it to this day if you have paid me to, because it doesn't make any sense that this Compass Realty is going to hire a hitman and all these people are going to be conspiring against him because one of the former employees of Compass, which is a multi-billion dollar corporation, uh, would have somehow been connected. They didn't like, Tellus, so they killed the reporter. Why don't you just kill Tellus? And Tellus had nothing to do anymore with anything. He was out of going to be out of office. So why? Why would you like? Why? It doesn't make any sense. So the jury would have to; those two members would have to, some way in their mind, make that make sense and add it into the hair theory, I guess. Unless you're thinking there's some whole other theory, and this is a random hitman that dresses, you know, like a Mortal Kombat character. And and just is out to kill. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what the hell they're thinking. Yeah, I mean, how how implausible when you really dissect the defense 
theory and you take it to its logical end, you're left with, like you said, saying like, huh, what? Uh, because, you know, would 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 this uh, uh, private company or or the police, I guess, hire a hitman to kill, literally murder an, an innocent person just in order to frame Mr. Tellus because they kind of didn't like him, even though he was leaving office soon anyway? It just does not stand up to scrutiny in my mind, but uh, I guess reasonable minds can differ. I don't know that it's a reasonable mind that can differ. I think it's a very twisted mind that can differ that doesn't quite see things the way they actually are. Um, yeah, I mean, none of it adds up at all, but he got that uh, that sentence. Let me ask you this about the Robert Tellis case. Um, obviously, at the end uh, of all of this, after they found him guilty, we had the victim impact statements from from both um, German's family and friends and Tellis's family as well, basically uh, many saying, yeah, please put him away. He's dangerous. If he's capable of doing this once, he'll be capable of doing it again. You know, I don't care about his family. I, I, again, I don't care about his family because I'm guessing he probably doesn't care about his family all that much if he's capable of doing something like this. Um, and in my mind, the best thing is if this is your family member, it's probably best not to have kids around this person. But obviously, that's not always the thinking you have. Uh, then his wife who came up, his ex-wife who came up, tell us this, uh, that we're like, oh, he's such a lovely father and family man and we really we really want him to still be there for the kids lives and i don't know that just doesn't compute to me <laughs> when you have a, a that's just me though i'm very i'm quick to cut the cord if, if somebody is going to be a toxic human being to my children or if they've demonstrated the ability to go murder people and lie about it um either or like sorry you're out um do you think that their um their testimony uh, about him being a father about him having young children played a role in this as well as the wig. You know, how could it have offset his demeanor on the stand? Like, talk about the last person you want in, like, your blunt rotation or just, like, hanging out with. Like, he was just, I, I, just being around him, listening to that testimony is aggravating. And, and you, you know, you're catching him in lies in your own head. And you're like, hey, that can't be right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I just wonder how that the testimony contrasted with how Robert Tellis presented on the stand and what he was really like in that courtroom to those jurors. Yeah, I mean, and, and what he was like... Um in the workplace. I mean, we, we've had people talk about what it was like working for him and, and he wasn't a pleasant individual. I mean, was he a different at home? Maybe, I don't know. I guess people can have very different demeanors, but he just seems like, I mean, the only thing I can think of is, you know, that family has been played. I mean, and that's what they do. That's what narcissists do. They, they can isolate you. They can kind of keep you away from seeing their own weird shit that's going on around them. And that's my guess is what was going on in that household. And, and their eyes, the wool has been pulled over their eyes for quite some time. Maybe at some point it would be you know, visible to them. You think maybe now he's charged with murder that hmm, maybe he's not what I thought he was. You know, maybe I just, yeah, maybe I should do something else, but they're still there. They're standing by him. Um, all of that. It just, it, it, it's, it's spooky to, to think of, 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 I don't know. Some, I was very surprised to see the wife even standing up for him. That, that was kind of surprising to me. Was it to you? Yeah, I mean, when you look at um, his testimony, at least in my opinion, he was trying to manipulate that jury. He's probably a master manipulator. Mm -hmm. You know, he engaged in deflection. Uh, he, he, he was he was making pleas for sympathy. Uh, you know, just uh, he he somehow uh, at times needed to take control of the examination. Just all characteristics that that we would associate with someone who's a master manipulator. And I can't help but wonder how that dynamic has played out in his personal life and whether it contributed to this family coming in and, and trying to have his back during the sentence. Well, even his own attorney didn't told the judge, I'm not going to go up there. I can't question him. I can't, I can't, he has to do a narrative. Otherwise I'm going to have to withdraw or we're going to have to retry this case. Um, even the attorney like kind of, I think knew enough, like this guy's fucking guilty. Um, and so that's what he let him do the narrative and thinking, Oh, this will totally sink him. What does it say just about our society? I, and let me ask you this. Are, are we seeing, more cases like this where it's really damning end up in situations like this where the sentencing ends up being way too light because there's a couple jurors that just believe the bullshit um, or, or we get not guilty verdicts because they just they can't accept the bullshit. Uh, I mean, we're in a society right now where people can't decipher truth from from false. Uh, we see it a lot in politics. And I'm not talking about opinions here. I'm talking about just 
Here's a video of this person saying this thing. It's not fake. It's real. No, fake. Yeah. You can't argue with that if they can't accept reality. And that's out there. That's our peers. That's our juries. At least a couple people in there. Is there more of that going on than there used to be where, where we're getting lesser sentences because of that way of thinking? You know, I'm wondering if if there is people are just kind of more skeptical of representations that they that are made to them because especially with the emergence of social media and disinformation and, and that whole thing, um, they're being duped more easily and they think something is true when it's not. So the second time they hear something, they're going to be a little more cautious with it. Perhaps that's coming into the courtroom. Skeptical is good. Skeptical means you're going to to look into it and go, hmm. I'm skeptical on this. Let me find out more information. I don't know that that's skeptical because a lot of this is just, this is what I heard. I don't know the source. I don't really, it's, it's, the, it's the defendant himself. It's the guy that they're charging with murder. This is what I heard from him. And I'm just going to believe it. That's not skeptical. That's just stupid. I, I hear you. And, and we'd hope that that they would come with a more critical approach because I saw most of Tells' testimony and I wasn't convinced by any of them. Uh, and, and, and I think that for, for you know, it's important to think about why is, is this happening and, and why are these outcomes playing out the way they are? And is it a function of, you know, society's inability to kind of accept facts anymore? Yeah, I mean, that's I, I do wonder about that, especially in a case like this. Why it was a bridge too far. The man's got the giant hat on, the blaze orch, the giant bag, the shoes that Telus always wears. Uh, it's not a bridge too far to think the man would put a wig on, um, especially knowing how bald he is. And I'm bald too. It's not a negative thing. It's just like, yeah, of course he's going to put on a wig. He's going to go to this length to draw it. He's, yeah, he doesn't want it to be recognized in any way, shape, or form. He apparently doesn't realize he's going to draw attention to himself, but he's certainly not that recognizable other than his gait, his walk, which is identical to how he walks. But the jury did not see that. I'm wondering if those jury members are going to come out of this and start to, you know, absorb more of the case that they didn't see in the courtroom and go, oh, OK. You, you know, that that very well could be. And, and it sort of reminds me of like the O.J. Simpson case, for example, when you're when you're a juror and you're in that courtroom, you're. Uh, in theory, isolated from other commentary, from other people's observations and opinions about what's going on. And then you kind of get out of that, uh, you know, sort of tunnel vision approach and and hear more about how other people are uh, taking this and other information you may not have had before. And then you start to scratch your head and say, oh, gosh, did I make a mistake? Yeah. And we, we do see that quite often because we have to remember there's many things they do not get to see. Uh, that's why it's, you know, don't talk to anybody. Don't look at media. Don't look at your social media. Don't talk to your family. Don't do anything because you're only entitled to see what we're saying. You should be able to see in this case to prevent anything coming in there that is inaccurate, but there is other accurate pieces. I'm surprised that we didn't get into evidence like the gate and things of that nature, which would have made a little more sense. But in the end of the day, this is what we got. Let's watch one piece of uh, clip here. This is uh, the prosecution. Again, putting all this into context, you still had two jurors at the end of the day and when it came to sentencing that were still questioning this with the hair, that this must have to be some sort of a reality um, uh, in determining what to sentence uh, tell us to. Let's take a look. And, and, and here's, here's the thing that struck me when, when, I, when I even I took over this case. I would submit to most people... Um, probably before ever hearing about this case, had no idea what a public administrator was. He is not a US senator. He is not a governor. He is not a congressperson. He is a, a duly elected official who manages an office of approximately eight people. And their job is to assist people who pass away, who don't leave a will and leave property behind. The public administrator's office is not at the forefront of everyone's mind in this community. No one learns about this until who brings the office to light? Jeff Gehrman. And, and what's amazing is if you believe that story about this conspiracy, all of these people and all of these entities were willing to sacrifice their reputation their business, their police department, even the public administrator's office, 
They're all willing to put it on the line to kill a reporter to get that guy, <laughs> even though he's leaving in three months? Does that make a shred of sense? Absolutely not. But what it does give you a window into is what's in his mind. That is how important Mr. Tellus views himself. That every single one of these people, every single one of these entities were literally willing to kill another human being who is not him, just to frame him. Put very well. Uh, again, you get back to like, would a reasonable person find that to be inaccurate? No, I mean, it's exactly what happened. Like you had to. I mean, again, they found him guilty, but I'm still just kind of baffled that we had this kind of hang up. Yeah, I mean, and I think the prosecutor did a masterful job and, mm -hmm. and uh, especially showing how uh, it tells his own defense just shows how self-important he thinks he is. Yes. He thinks he's like this big shot who, who the government or this huge multi-million dollar company is going to frame and yeah. kill an innocent person over. You're not that big of a deal, bro. No, he's well, he also thinks he can, you know, magically heal his, his healing process. Remember we talked about that? Oh, yeah. He has that magical healing process. And had he not put the super glue on, he, he would have done better he can't speak to other people's healing processes but but that's his i mean just i'm on the stand how self-important he thought he was yeah uh, no it was, yeah. it was clear and it, you could see in his demeanor just what he exuded just his the way his way of of talking his arrogance with the prosecutor uh, who was skewering him left and right and tell us thought he was doing a great job up there because uh you know he probably has a pretty high opinion how do you think he's gonna do in prison <laughs> with that attitude <laughs> You know, one thing he he might have going for him is he is a former attorney. And so I've heard that attorneys, when incarcerated, can sometimes be valuable because they can help with appeals and that kind of thing. But um, but in, but in terms of personality, man, uh, I think he's in for a rough hole. I wonder what he was like as an attorney. Do we even know his track record? Of it? Like, I've, I haven't found anything on that. Um, no. So it's like it's probably because they're all in prison. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he went from from law. At, at one point, he was an attorney, and then he was this public administrator role. And um, yeah, I, I'd I'd be happy to go against him in court. I yeah. can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for checking out the video. Be sure to follow us wherever you download podcasts, and especially Apple Podcasts, where you can get advanced episode and premium content on our premium channel right there. Also, be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss any breaking updates on the stories that matter to you most. We're on TikTok, X, Instagram, Facebook. Just search Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi, and you'll find us right there. Again, thanks for watching.